I solved it. I seated all the resumes of prospective candidates and we'll have them compete for the job. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. I figured that this week I'd devote a little bit of time to both Princeton and FDU, who were the Dragon Slayers or uh, the Davids beating the Goliaths this week with uh, unbelievable, earth-shaking uh, wins for Princeton, Arizona, and Missouri, and of course for the FDU Knights defeating uh the number one seeded team in their region, the Purdue Boilermakers, who are ranked as high as number one this year, and I think finished the regular season as the third ranked team. And here, FDU took them on. They were losing late. Uh, I was watching the game and, and coming in and out of it because I was doing some stuff, but uh, I did turn on the game late and saw that they were down, and then they hit the three, and things took off uh, for the Boilermakers. Sunday, Yesterday's game, I watched. Uh, it was it was funny. They come out at uh, halftime trailing by seven points, I believe, and they were just lights out, hit just burying threes all over the place. And all of a sudden, you're saying to yourself, "Wow, um, I wish this happened a little bit later in the game because it kind of sometimes you you know you give that knockout punch and uh, for a team, and it might be a little bit too soon in the game." And, of course, uh, Florida Atlantic was able to recover, and uh, they win the game, kind of run away late, 78-70. FDU, I think, got it as close as three with about five, maybe six minutes left in the game. But uh, the score did not in indicate how close that game was for at least, uh, I would say, at least 30, maybe even 33 minutes into the game because it was back and forth in the second half. It was a great game. Uh, the, the fans were really electrified and pushing, I think, for uh, FDU. At least most of the crowd in Columbus was pushing for them. And for the Knights, they have nothing to be ashamed about. This is actually, now they have three wins in the NCAA tournament. They had the play-in game and, of course, the big victory over Purdue. Go out two and one. And for most teams, <laughs> I mean, there are teams who are playing in the power conferences, and I think about Northwestern, I think about maybe uh, the Minnesotas, or I think about Oregon States, who have never, uh, well, Minnesota did get to the Final Four, but these are teams playing, quote unquote, with the big boys, and they haven't had as remarkable, um, you can say, resume uh, as FDU had this year, or, or just uh, a, a breathtaking win like the Knights did this year, defeating Purdue. And they were never, I, from what I see, and I, I did see some of the replays of the game earlier and stuff, you never, uh, watching the players after you, they never felt intimidated by uh, Purdue. Uh, and it was just, it just sensed that the later in the game that after you could take the lead, the better it was for the chances of winning. What I mean is that, there would be so much momentum going, and then there would be that fear factor probably weighing on the minds of Purdue, all right? And that's what I was saying about yesterday's game. It's it's too bad that they didn't have that one big rush, not coming out, although they needed it, obviously, but maybe with about 10 minutes uh, left in the game, and then have that big rush because then it, it, you knock down your opponent, and sometimes psychologically they can't get back up off the mat to uh, basically recover and get their bearings and come back. It does happen. Anyway, the Knights with two and one in this uh, tournament, you know, you have St. Peter's last year going three and one, but in those three wins, they're knocking off both Kentucky, a multi uh, time winner of the NCAA tournament. And then, of course, Purdue, which has gotten to the final four. I think the last time Purdue actually was to the final four was 1980 with uh, Joe Barry Carroll. Actually, that year, 80, Iowa uh, from the Big Ten and Purdue from the uh, Big Ten both make the Final Four. And ready for this? Louisville and UCLA wind up playing for the national title. Of course, that was a great Louisville team led by, uh, they were called the Doctors of Dunk and led by Daryl Griffin. Uh, I remember Iowa having a, a player who was 
reminds me of one of the guys I'm going to talk about today, Kevin Boyle, kind of like looks and just a, a physical presence. He was known as a good, really good defensive uh, player. I think he had some calling. I think he is drafted in the NBA. Maybe he gets a couple of years in. Uh, and of course, Joe Barry Carroll, that was one of Lute Olson's teams, I believe, that Purdue team. And of course, Olson goes off to really uh, build Arizona into a future uh, national champion as well. So anyway, I was looking at FDU and Princeton and a shout out to Princeton. Wait a minute. Uh, Princeton uh, gets another big win. Of course, they are probably, you know, it's interesting. Is Princeton more well known for their final four appearance with Bill Bradley, who we'll talk about, or are they more uh, known by fans for their almost win against the Georgetown Hoyas, when I do believe we had the first year of instituting the seedings of one through 16. And of course, they lost that game 50 to 49, lost it late. Uh, Georgetown, of course, was baffled for the most part by the backdoor layup of Pete Carell's Tigers. But in the end, uh, there was a big, Big uh, block, I think, by uh, Alonzo Mourning on the uh, Princeton Tigers. That kind of sealed the deal for the Hoyas. And, of course, they would be beaten, the Hoyas that year would be beaten in the regional finals, I believe, by, ooh, I want to say Duke. And, of course, Duke winds up in the Final Four with Seton Hall, Michigan, and Illinois. In fact, people don't realize this in the in – the, uh, in the regional finals, Syracuse got beat by Illinois. Seton Hall defeats uh, UNLV. Georgetown loses to uh, Duke. They could have had three teams again uh, from the Big East in the Final Four within a space of four years. Pretty That would have been remarkable. As it is, they had three teams in from the Final Eight. Pretty incredible. Anyway, uh, Prince, well, I, I would just wanted to get to this. Uh, just a, a shout out for FDU, and then I'm going to go to Princeton. And that is this. I didn't realize this. Al Lobalbo was uh, a longtime assistant in the uh, NBA and um, coached at FDU. I'm just getting, just getting my bearings on, on that. Uh, eventually, he's replaced by Donald Feely and then Tom Green. Now, Tom Green, I was just looking uh, at, at this. He's the first coach for FDU to bring him to the NCAA tournament. I knew he brought him twice. I didn't realize he brought him three times to the NCAA tournament. Pretty remarkable. He actually uh, was wins five seasons of 20 or more wins for the Knights. And, of course, his, his tenure started in 1983-84 and ends – in 2008-09. So you're talking about 23 years, better than two decades with FDU, which is pretty remarkable in this day and age where many coaches have, let's say, five, six good years, or uh, they're at a school of five, six good years. Then they get that program into the NCAA tournament, maybe win, uh, make a couple of trips, and then uh, they move on to the next uh, level. You know, because let's face it, the level one is the Big Ten, the Southeast Conference, the ACC, to a certain extent, the Big East, at least for basketball, obviously, the Pac-12, the SEC, I said that, uh, the Big 12. And then you get your next tier, which is like the AAC, which is what Temple, Houston, uh, Navy for football, they compete in. You get maybe the Sun Belt, uh, I'm just trying to think, the Atlantic 10 and Mountain West, those those types of schools and conferences, and then the lower rung. You know, it's, you move up, and uh, Tom Green, though, chose to stay, and boy, what a remarkable job he did do. Like I said, he won five times, he won 20 games, probably even more. I, I was just doing, let's just say, his first year, he goes 17 and 12. Next, then he wins 20 back-to-back. He won 23 out of four seasons. The four seasons, he had 19. So he averaged 20 wins a year in his uh, for four years there. Uh, and then he wins 22 again. 
uh, doesn't have his first losing season until he's well in, like 10 years in, writes the ship, 16 and 12, full, fades a little bit. But then in 1997, 98, Tom Green gets back to his third final four. He goes in as a 15th seed. Um, Green goes in uh, that year, his first year. I'm going to give a little bit more attention. His last year was, uh, like I said, the 2004 05. They lost to Illinois. Interestingly enough, it seems like the Northeast Conference, and in particular FDU, always winds up playing a, a Big Ten team. Uh, because uh, I was at, I do remember this, a buddy of mine went to uh, FDU, and we decided to go to the NEC championship game. They beat Monmouth. Uh, that was Tom Green's second trip to the NCAA. And I remember them playing it in Teaneck. It was a crazy game, a really good game. They had a kid named Jamie Laintner, or Latner, a uh, good player, power forward, uh, who was on that team. And that FDU team goes out to Purdue. Then, now, this is 87-88. There was quite a bit of stir in New Jersey because Seton Hall had also made it. So um, New Jersey was being well represented in, in the tournament. Well, they lose to Purdue that year, 94-79. So you're starting to think that <laughs> Friday night's game over Purdue was kind of revenge for the FDU Knights of Teaneck and uh, their campus and the university and their history as well. Because like I said, they lost to Illinois, they lost to Michigan, they lost to Purdue in three of their four trips. Um, and then, of course, they lost to Gonzaga and, of course, FAU this year. But just to talk about this, I do remember in 85, again, I, I well, listen, I was watching quite a bit of sports then I didn't have the responsibilities I have now. But uh, in 1985, the year that Villanova won and Georgetown gets in there and St. John's and, of course, Memphis State, known as Memphis State, now they're Memphis University. And that had been their second trip to the Final Four because they made it when I was a kid in 73 against UCLA. I'm digressing. Let's get back here. Anyway, um, after you lost by just a couple of points in that game, yeah, they lost by four points to Michigan. In that game, it was playing Dayton. You have all the Dayton Flyer fans who are just crazed, rooting for FDU. And I just remember, they didn't have the coverage that they do today where you have four or five networks broadcasting these games. All the games were on ESPN. And, well, I shouldn't say that. The day games were on ESPN. Some of the night games were on ESPN. And then CBS, I think, had their pick of what games they wanted to show prime time. Usually it was the big schools from the big conferences. And you're talking about the Michigans and the Ohio States and the North Carolinas, that sort. But this was one of the first games played at night. And I just recall this. FDU is winning this game. They're beating Bill Kreider and the Michigan Wolverines late. And then there was a couple of turnovers, I think, by the Knights. And then finally, Michigan is just, you know, the talent, the bench, just too deep. And I just um, I just remember how heartbroken I was for FDU. I just wanted to see uh, Michigan beaten. And, uh, you know, they lost 59-55. <laughs> Again, it is my rule of thumb, though. I'm rooting against Michigan in that game. And lo and behold, what happens? They win. <laughs> it's my curse, I guess. If I root for Michigan, they lose. If I go against Michigan, they win. So maybe I should have been rooting for Michigan that night. I don't know. But anyway, um, the, then, uh, of course, under Greg Herenda, uh, the Knights move on. And they are 18 and 15 in 2015 and 2016 and 21 and 14 in 2018 and 19. The reason I remember the last uh, time that prior to this year, the last time that um, FDU had been to the big dance was that there was a kid who I used to coach or a referee and he made a layup late in the game. And it was kind of cool because he was coming back from a knee injury. And I think uh, the coach had called timeout, specifically put him in the game. 
and he was able to score basically on a breakaway layup. Didn't really mean that much. Probably, you know, the final score is 87-49, so they were down 40 when he put in the, the bucket and won. Um, I can't remember. Uh, I just remember uh, Nadi uh, Basiri just scoring that. He had come back from an injury uh, during the season, and it was just a great moment. I really thought it was going to make that one shining moment that they play uh, each year because it was just a great moment. Uh, the coach gave him a big hug. The team, uh, his teammates went crazy because here he is uh, in his final NCAA game after hurting, uh, suffering a knee injury, I think, and then returning and then getting a, a shot playing in the game. It was just a great moment. It's what college basketball is all about. And of course, this year, you know, Tobin Anderson, Brings in a couple of players with him from St. Thomas Aquinas, Chris Singleton and Dimitri Roberts. You know, it wasn't like they didn't have a, a good season prior to this. They they wind up winning 20 games. I think they come into the tournament with maybe 19. And uh, so they finished 21 and 16 on the season. Big win over Purdue. There, there's a, That is like winning the tournament for them. And that is why these lower seeds, when they beat number one like this, or they beat the higher seed of significant, uh, you know, difference, a 15 over a two or a 14 over a three, it's big because it helps the program, number one. It adds so much excitement and drama to the NCAA tournament. You don't want all the, the lower seeds to just give up and go home. And just you're left with, you know, always the big time conferences. You love the little guy story. You love the Cinderella. You wish it would last for six full games. One day we'll get that Hoosier moment, believe me, uh, in the tournament. I, I think it may be just around the corner. Uh, maybe within the next four or five years, we might just see Cinderella not win just one or two games, but the whole March Madness tournament. All right. And then... Uh, now, I just want to turn to, to Princeton. So a great job by FDU, great job by their coach. And you wonder now, um, will the rumor mill start with him maybe uh, leaving FDU and getting, you know, uh, the next tier job? I doubt it. I think uh, he likes it there and he'll probably stay. But who knows? You know, the coaching carousel changes all the time. Ed Cooley now is being rumored to be going to Georgetown and leaving Providence. And it happens. It's just one of those things. And it's just part of the game. So you deal with it and move on. Now, I didn't realize this. So this was some fun. I want to turn turn to Princeton here and with another cartoon. I think I did show this. And if I did. And it really is the Jersey Tomatoes, what we're known for in this state, the Garden State, of course. People don't realize this, but about 50% of the state is still uh, how do I say this? Uh, it's still either farmland or wilderness. People don't realize that. So I, I, I figured, you know what? Shout out to our one of our great products, the Jersey Tomato. <laughs> and of course, I'm including St. Peter's here because it has been fun. Do you realize these three schools have probably won more games collectively in the last two years than our big guys, Seton Hall and Rutgers? And I think everybody does get behind all of the teams, the Jersey teams, when they get into the tournament. And I, I think that's what I most liked. And that's what uh, hurt so much when after you la lost last night, because I could see the same kind of enthusiasm building behind FDU as did St. Peter's last year. It was just incredible. But anyway, all right. So the Jersey Tomatoes, St. Peter's with their glorious win over Kentucky and Purdue. Uh, Princeton with their two big victories so far, and we're going to get into that, uh, over Arizona and Missouri. And, of course, Fairleigh Dickinson defeating Purdue and then being ousted last night. So collectively, in the last two years, three and one, two and one, that's five and two, and two and oh, that's seven wins for, let's say, the lower tiered conferences from New Jersey. Not bad. Not bad at all. And, of course, they beat Big time schools, Missouri, uh, Purdue twice, Kentucky, and of course, Arizona. Not bad. And of those, really, when you think about it, um, Arizona has won a championship. Kentucky has won a national title. 
Uh, Missouri still hasn't gotten to the Final Four, as I know. And like I said, Purdue's been there a couple of times. I think they got there in 69 with Rick Mount. And then, of course, like I stated, with, in 1980 with Joe Barry Carroll and uh, the 1980 team. Now, turn our attention to another school that did make a Final Four, and that, of course, being the Princeton Tigers. And I'm just going to give you just some I, – I didn't get any pictures of Tom Green or the FDU. Apologize. But anyway, here is um, Butch Van Bredikoff. I know I pronounced that correctly. Say that about 10 times each. <laughs> You're going to stumble over the words. And, of course, that is Bill Bradley. This is later on. And, of course, this guy down here, that's the young version of Pete Carrill. I do not know what year, per se, this is. This might be, though – within his first couple of years taking over the Tiger helm. And of course, Carell, of course, <laughs> he's one of the funniest, most animated coaches that you can think of. His hair would be always out, <laughs> kind of like Einstein. And uh, But instead of being kind of curly, it was straight. So it looked like, I don't know, he looked like he had just shocked himself by putting um, his finger, unfortunately, in a socket. But... He would, <laughs> he was just a fun coach to watch on the sidelines. He was worth the price of the ticket just to watch him. He was also a fantastic coach. And Kirill uh, spun some magic. And people don't realize this, but uh, I'm just going to start with this. The very first coach who got Princeton into the big dance. And of course it wasn't called the big dance then at one point, the, uh, the NCAA uh, had only eight teams. You realize that the NIT. So I still take some pride in this, at least when Seton Hall won in 1953 was on a par or even seen as the better tournament or with more respect. Uh, it wasn't until really the NCAA really, uh, got started on the thing and, and said, Ooh, we can really start controlling this and expanded uh, the tournament that they really uh, took the grip and made it the tournament that it is today. That and the fact that UCLA won so many of the titles. Interestingly enough, and I don't know, I'd like to talk to some real sports historians and reporters about this. Uh, did UCLA's dynasty help or hurt college basketball? Because it was very popular in the 50s, very popular in the 60s. Then UCLA and John Wood rest control, really, of college basketball. When I tell you, when I was a kid, it was just unbelievable. Well, first of all, I was right in the throes of it. So you're talking about my first years probably watching NCAA basketball is probably like 69. So they won in 64. They won in 65. Texas, they took a year off. Texas Western, which is now UTEP, wins with the first uh, all of five uh, blacks starting for Don Haskins. 67, we go back to UCLA. 68, it's UCLA again. 69, it's UCLA. 70, it's UCLA. 71, it's UCLA. When Howard Porter and Villanova make the Final Four along with Western Kentucky and Kansas. The reason that I can remember is that I specifically recall that Western Kentucky Villanova semifinal was played in the Astrodome. Remember, uh, the the playing court was above the players on the benches, and they had netting around it. I've said this in the past on the show. And when players went dough for loose balls, <laughs> they would slide off the court and into the netting in some respects. But that game against uh, – uh, Villanova, Western Cook was a classic. I just wish people could see that game. Uh, it was tied. I think it went to two overtimes. And then finally, Villanova outlasted Western Kentucky. And of course, Western Kentucky had Jim McDaniels. Howard Porter played for Villanova. It was just a, a, a classic game. And of course, then Villanova uh, came close, but came up short against UCLA. Of course, UCLA wins in 71. And, of course, UCLA wins in 72. And, of course, no. Uh, yes, UCLA wins in 73. But then they're stopped in 74 by David Thompson and the North Carolina State Wolfpack. And um, I was actually rooting for Marquette in the finals. Uh, they got beat UCLA not in the finals but in the semis. 
and I think they lost 80 to 77. And maybe with a three-pointer, uh, three-point arc, they might have won that game. Who knows? And then, of course, rather than than uh, lick their wounds, you say like storms storming back in 75 in Wooden's last year and <laughs> wins the tournament. So from 64 to 75, they won every year except for two. And in 66, I don't even think they went to the tournament. I think they had one bad year under Wooden. Uh, but like I said, now they're winning all that. And you just wonder, did that bring uh, more popularity to the tournament or did it hurt the tournament? You know, what having dynasties is that good for a sport or bad i think a lot of people would would accept the fact that would accept that dynasties do give identity to the sport that you're uh following hockey with the canadians football with the green bay packers and to a certain extent now uh the patriots all right and the only reason i'm not denigrating the patriots what i'm saying is when you think of football probably the first thing when you think of it with dynasty because the Packers were right there uh, at the beginning of real TV watching of the NFL, and they were the dominant team. And that's why I was thinking more Packers. Of course, the Yankees with, uh, you know, just eras of greatness, decades of greatness. And of course, basketball, UCLA, the Celtics, and the Lakers to a certain extent. More the Celtics, though. Because they, they were really doing and they, they did it over a long period of time with Bill Russell as well. So you wonder if uh, dynasties are good. And I would agree that they're good up to a point, And then it's nice to see new teams, especially in the college. Probably works more in the pros than it does in the college. How's that? Okay. Because even well, I'm going to digress here. All right. So the very first guy who coaches Princeton, and this is what I love. His name was Cappy Cappen, C-A-P-P-O-N. He actually came from Michigan. And interestingly enough, he was the AD at Michigan. He compiled a 78 and 57 record there. And then he goes to Princeton, and boy, oh boy, he's 268 and 185, all right? Not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, he won five regular season Ivy League crowns. And then he gets in. Now, Princeton, whether you want to hear this or not, has really not been a good tournament team. In fact, when I'm looking at this right now, 63-64, they win one game. They beat VMI, and then they lose. They go one and two in the tournament. Uh, really, the highlight of their career still remains the Bradley NCAA tournament when Bill led Prince, I couldn't believe this. He averaged 30 points his senior year. He averaged 32. I knew he scored a lot. I didn't realize he scored that many. Uh, that really, because how many how many 30 point scores do you see today? Even with a three pointer, it's a different game. I get it. It's more athletic. I get it. Uh, better, better defense. I get all that. But you still have a three point shot. Bradley didn't have that then, and he averaged 30 points a game. Uh, he was the go-to guy. In 64-65, they make the Final Four. And um, they defeated, ready for this, Penn State. Then they beat North Carolina State and Providence to meet uh, to get into the Final Four. Now, in the semis, they lost to Michigan and Cassie Russell. <laughs> of course. Who wins that year? It's UCLA with Gail Goodrich and I think Walt Hazard. But at that time, they were playing consolations galore in the NCAA tournaments. Uh, I used to like it. I do. I used to like it for the Final Four because you say to yourself, oh, man, you get here. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a week of knowing you're playing in one game, potentially. Give them the second one if you lose. I know a lot of people don't want to play that second game because it's, it's devastating. But it is kind of fun to finish at least in third place and say, well, you know, we had uh, – let's say a, a four and one or a five and one or a six and one uh, tournament. And it is kind of cool. Now, uh, since about, I would say probably about, I think actually Rutgers and UCLA probably played in the last consolation game. They've gotten rid of it. So here they are. Here's Cap. 
can't be capping uh, as the first one. Now, he didn't do well in the tournament. He does win one game, 1960-61. Actually, it wasn't he. He was replaced, but at least it was his squad. As I was reading about this, all right, he lost to Duquesne, LaSalle, and Duke. And then his 60-61 squad, he guides it to a 92 post, but unfortunately passes away from his second heart attack. And I was reading about it. He actually suffered the second one uh, at the gym, uh, at a practice. And, of course, there was no recovery. Jake McCandless, or McCandles, excuse me, takes over the team, goes 9-6. and six. So they win the Ivy. They're, they're brought in, and they beat George Washington in the first game. Then they lose to St. Joe's to be eliminated, but then they play in a consolation game against St. Bonaventure. Um, so in those first four uh, tournaments that Princeton was in under Cappy, Cappen, or his, uh, his protégés, Princeton went two, uh, one, and seven. Now, interestingly enough, they didn't play a consolation game against Duke. They just lost flat out and went home, I guess. Then Butch Van Bredekoff brings them uh, really to the height of Princeton basketball until Pete Carell gets there. Van Bredekoff leads them to the 62-63 season. They go 0-1. They lost to St. Joe's. They win one game, beat VMI in 63-64, then lose to UConn, and then in the consolation, lose to Villanova. And like I said, under Bill Bradley, let me get you a picture of Bill Bradley. I just love this. Because the other player that uh, I do remember having a significant uh, NBA career from Princeton was Armand Hill, who was on their 76 team, 75-76 team. Didn't realize, I always thought he was a senior that year. He does play uh, one more year for Princeton and then is drafted uh, by the Atlanta Hawks and plays a couple of seasons in the NBA. Maybe he lasted five years. I can't remember. But Bill Bradley, these, without a doubt. <laughs> I had this card. <laughs> I always laugh at this one. I'm sure Tops did not get permission from the NBA to use their uh, trademarks or the names of their teams. <laughs> what they do, they had the players obviously switch their uniforms, put them on backwards. And I'm saying to myself, what would Bradley have done had he gone to Bradley University? They probably would have had him in a warm-up jersey. But anyway, I always thought this as a kid. Here's Bill Bradley. He went to the Ivy Leagues, and he didn't know how to put his shirt on the right way. And you're saying, wait a minute. He's Ivy League. He's Rhodes Scholar, and he doesn't know how to put his jersey on the right way. But it's because I do believe that the NBA uh, didn't give Chops permission. And I will tell you this. If you own these cards, now this is 70, 71, I believe. These are the regular cards that you know uh, collectors have. These, and I've I, I've waxed poetic about this. They were about they were about a size and a half larger than the regular cards that we get in the stores today. And they were solid, solid cardboard. So you could bend them, obviously, just like the others, but it took a little bit more, let's say, strength or um, they were uh, just a, a little bit stronger. It was very thick cardboard that they were on. And like I said, an unusual length. If you have those cards today and they're pristine, pure, I I think they are well worth a bundle. As it is, though, uh, I had those cards. I love them because they were so big and they fit so well in your hands. And uh, I just remember having those and don't know what happened. You know, it's the old story, the shopping bag full of baseball cards that mom, when she does the spring cleaning, says, ah, Sonny doesn't need these anymore. I'll just toss them out. And of course, they're worth a fortune today. But that Princeton team is 64-65, does get to the Final Four. In that Wichita State game, I think Bradley sets the all-time score uh, for points in a single game. I think, I don't know, he went off on Wichita State. I don't even know. To be fair, I want to say he scored like 50, but I know I'm wrong. But he, he, he scored a bundle of points, and it did set a record, at least, I think, for the final four games. All right. And then, of course, boom, 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 boom. Pete Carrill takes over 68-69. 
Didn't realize how long he really coached there. Pete Carrill went from 68, 69, all the way up to um, like 03, 04. Wow. I didn't realize that. So that's uh, coached in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the aughts, before he stepped down. 50 years. And in that, he's definitely well known for uh, the loss which everyone thinks is a victory. He lost by a point to Georgetown in 1989. People don't realize this. He lost to Arkansas the following year by only four points. And then um, the game that I remember the most with Kirill, and I knew it was going to be a great game. It was an 8-9 seeded game with Villanova coming out of the uh, Big East and Princeton, of course, the winners of the Ivy League. And why they were seeded so high, they were a ninth seed that year. Princeton was 24-3. and three. They beat, out of conference, Cleveland State, St. Mary's. Now, why I say Cleveland State? Because uh, for a while there, Cleveland State had some good teams. In fact, uh, they stunned Indiana in a first-round game with a kid named Mouse McFadden. That was his nickname, Mouse McFadden. But they played a, a real... Fast break oriented pressing offense, and it drove Indiana crazy. And uh, uh, Cleveland State gets to the Sweet 16, but that wasn't a year that uh, they played Princeton. But uh, Cleveland State does schedule a game with Princeton. Uh, that was one of Princeton's victims, along with St. Mary's, who has built into a pretty strong NCAA tournament type team. They beat Iona, which had been in and out of the tournament. Remember, uh, they were a really good team. In the 70s, that's when they started getting good with Jeff Ruland. Ruland and um, they had uh, Ruland and Gary Springer, who was a big-time player in high school, loved him in the college. And, of course, Valvano was their coach. They had some really uh, successful teams, the Gales did, in New Rochelle during those years. They beat Rutgers and UC Santa Barbara. They lost to UNLV, and they lost to Santa Clara. Now they come up against Nova. It was a classic. Two of the same kind of guys. Roly Massimino with his hair out. I I got to be honest with you. The game was decided, I'm sure, by who had more hair follicles in their head. And I think it was Roly, but just barely. And he defeated Pete Carell. When I tell you, they were both the same build, the same look, the same craziness on the sidelines. They were both worth uh, really... <laughs> the ticket to watch and just watch them go crazy on the sidelines. But Pete Carrell, and then of course, Carrell does get his NCAA championship in a way when he stunned UCLA in the 75 76 first game. And I think they were a 14th seed, Princeton, that year. And then they lost to Mississippi State. And I do believe Mississippi State made the Final Four that year. So it wasn't too bad. Then he lost to Texas in his last two. Now, these are their first wins, the uh, Princeton Tigers over Arizona and Mizzou. They have to play Creighton. It's going to be a good game. I'm not making a prediction. Uh, but look, Arizona and Mizzou, I, I watched Mizzou play this year. Uh, that one didn't surprise me. The Arizona one definitely surprised me uh, because I was looking at Princeton's schedule and even though they're like 23 and 8, they really weren't good out of conference this year. Uh, and so I was really stunned that they beat Arizona. I mean, I had them, I had actually Arizona going to uh, at least one of the eight teams making it because I thought that the bracket, or at least uh, to this weekend. <laughs> so there went my uh, bracket, brackets right up in flames. I mean, Kansas, them losing. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately I have Xavier left and that's about it so much for my, uh, predictions. That's why you should never listen to my predictions about that. But, um, I do want to focus on this and really give a shout out to the NIT and to the Princeton Tigers. And that was 74, 75. I do remember that year. Remember this in when Rutgers made their great run to the final four in 76, one of the toughest games they played was against Princeton. And I remember them playing it up in the Civic Center in Rhode Island. So it was kind of, it was an NCAA tournament game that Rutgers had to win, but it was kind of weird because uh, 
it was a tournament game, but it, I, I felt like Rutgers and Princeton had played like three games already that year. So it was just an extension. It was like a mini series coming to play. Anyway, Rutgers uh, really frustrated the Scarlet Knights that day. Rutgers does win the game. And then they would beat VMI, UConn, and get to the Final Four, where they would lose to Michigan and then lose to UCLA in the consolation game. I know I'm leaving one other school that the Rutgers beat that year uh, to get to the Final Four, but I know they beat VMI, they beat Princeton, and they beat UConn on a Thursday night, I remember. Anyway, I just want to do a shout-out for the Princeton team of 74-75. I do believe Armand Hill was on that team. Now that I said it, he probably wasn't. But the 74-75 team was really good. They lost to Notre Dame. They lost to Rutgers. Of course, Rutgers was getting better. And Notre Dame was in the throes of that Digger Phelps run there where they, they were just getting some really solid players, great players, uh, and NBA players to come uh, to South Bend. They lost to South Carolina and Duke twice. But then they beat Villanova and Temple during the regular season. Well, lo and behold, here comes the NIT. Princeton defeats Holy Cross, which had solid teams. I think they had Ronnie Perry on that team. They beat South Carolina, which had some good teams in the 70s. All right? And this makes up for the loss that they had earlier in the season. Then they beat Oregon. And I think Lonnie Shelton was on that team. And of course, in the championship game, they defeated Providence to win the NIT 1974-75 and finished 12th in the nation in the AP final poll. Pretty good season. Pete Carrill, the Princeton Tigers. Maybe it's a foreshadowing of things to come this week for the Tigers as they take on Creighton, trying to get to the Final Four again for the first time in six decades. This is Will O'Toole thanking you again for watching Park Ridge Sports History. Special shout out to Howard Frederick for all his help. See you next week.